welcome to this Medical Life podcast. These are the stories of medicine with Steve Davis and Dr. Travis Brown. This is the earnest autopsy of Oscar Wilde. Dr. Travis Brown, I hope you'll be yourself because everybody else has already taken. <laughs> Very good quote. <laughs> yes. From, of course, Oscar Wilde. Uh, and I think he is a wonderful figure for us to throw our medical spotlight on because there's a great anecdote of his that I picked up. I just read uh, Oscar, A Life by Matthew Sturgis. Amazing book. And the anecdote that did the rounds was about Wilde refusing to take some medicine on account of it being, I quote, a dingy brown colour. Um, the chemist promptly replaced it with a bottle of beautiful rose red liquid and some pills that, quote, shone like gold, which Wilde was delighted to ingest. <laughs> well, he's a man of style, I'm sure. So <laughs> we are taking some time. We haven't done this kind of an episode in a, in a well, actually quite a long time. Uh, this is taking a reflection of the, the podcast and where we've come. This is shining a spotlight on a historical figure and sort of going back in time, looking at the medicine, looking at society in this in this instance as well with, with Oscar Wilde, and then looking at his health uh, and sort of his journey through life. Uh, and this was really, I mean, the way I say it's a milestone because you know we've called this the 100th episode and people can see sequentially that doesn't quite work <laughs> if you're looking just at the, the feed, but you take into account this Pathological Life podcast, this Medical Life podcast, and we're well over 100. And so this was something planned to do, you know, with the 100, but uh, time and, and other episodes got in the way and sort of we just wanted to take some time to say, hey, you know, this is this is a bit of a milestone for us. Well, I think uh, a story about Oscar that I think marries here is for one of his plays, I just can't remember which one, for the uh, opening night, he wore, had a, a suddenly fantastic idea to wear some green carnation, so a green carnation on his lapel, and he got his friends who were going with him to do it, and he got the lead actor of his play to re wear one also, and said nothing about it. And so people saw the lead actor, they then noticed Oscar and his crew all wearing green carnations. It led to a sudden burst of popularity because no one knew what it meant. And he just manufactured this mystique to the point that florists were suddenly inundated with people and green carnations became a thing. And they were really hard because you had to dye the plant, the, the flowers, etc. It, it was an overnight sensation. So the original influencer, I think. Yes, that is. <laughs> really. And look, he was, he was a, he's a poet, he's a playwright. Uh, there's amazing quotes. His witticisms are timeless. Uh, and, and look, our paths kind of cross in, 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 in odd and <laughs> unexpected ways, sort of. My seed for this pathological life actually comes from when I was in medical school, an ENT surgeon came in and presented, and it was on ENT, of course, uh, and he said, Oscar Wilde died of something that everyone else thinks he didn't die from. And so this was where it, sort of, it captured my attention. Unfortunately, I can't remember much else about a lecture, but that got me. So uh, I'm not sure if that was the NT surgeon would call that a success or not. Uh, but that was the seed. And then, you know, that discussion about different forms of pathology was the lead in. And you also have been impacted by Oscar Wilde's story. Where does this talked about come from? Well, in fact, yes, I have a – my marketing consultancy has talked about marketing. I think it was a realisation in high school doing English and discovering Oscar Wilde and hearing that quote, there's only one thing worse than being talked about, and that's not being talked about, which is interesting. <laughs> I love public speaking and being at the front, and many people hate that. And so I, I felt some simpatico there with the – and then I reflected on it recently when I – uh, had an, an occasion to create this agency, the name just hit me because I had forgotten about it consciously and realised that I kind of lived my life the whole way following that credo. Uh, and so, yes, I feel very much in line with him. I, I just love the fact that 
uh, also for the reason I like Leonard Cohen's work, it's never obvious. Like there's always wonderful curiosity behind something and then interplay. But also just to reflect back on your dealing with that lecturer, because you sort of didn't agree. Well, you, you were intrigued by him and then, yeah, hang on a minute, you, <laughs> you want to go further. And there's an actual quote from Oscar Wilde who said, whenever people agree with me, I always feel I must be wrong. <laughs> And and this 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 personality, it, if people enjoy reading, it jumps off the page. There is a there is a sort of a timelessness, uh, and in fact, this is almost Shakespearean. Like his story is a tragedy, and we will go through that today. And look, the the amazing thing about all this, and as we sort of delve into the first part of this about where we are from a medical perspective and a societal perspective, this is less than 200 years ago. And sort of how far we have come, we can still go further. But mm. the the whole point about his care it sometimes just takes a moment to reflect and sort of say, geez, we actually have come quite a way. Well, there is fallibility in the where the medical fraternity was up to at that time and fallibility in him himself he, he th this matthew sturgis book shows that for all his brilliance th there was a brokenness <laughs> there as well a self-sabotage almost which i mean he also did say that i think god in creating man somewhat overestimated his ability <laughs> And I think that's a lovely tone. <laughs> and and that's the 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 part that I think I'm attracted to and why I like some of his writings is because there's a humanness to it. There's not perfectionism, even though he may have been a perfectionist, but there's also acknowledgement of 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 the failings of, you know, and, and we will see some, I think, mistakes that he made. Uh, that sort of makes his life go down a path. Now, he was actually born in, in 1854. He was born in Dublin, Ireland, and he died in 1900. Now, he lived in London. He ended up doing a travelling lecture series around the uh, United States for a year. So I wanted to sort of look back, okay, well, where were we from a medical perspective in the 1850s to the, to the 1900s? And this was kind of the beginning of modern medicine. This was where we just started to learn. So this was probably the seed of our understanding today. We're starting to do the scientific methodology. It's important to note when we actually put little sort of pins in things and say, oh, this is when we learnt about that that information still takes decades for it to filter down and sometimes longer for it to filter down to the actual, mm -hmm. you know, boots on the ground and people being affected by it. But the the main causes of death at this time for, for people, and particularly we're mainly focusing in England because that's where he lived, uh, was, you know, infectious disease. And this was smallpox, measles, diphtheria, uh, whooping cough, typhus, cholera, but infectious diseases weren't known. There was it, contagion was kind of known, but the the prominent theory of contagion was miasma, which is bad air. So if you walked into sort of a bad air area or or anything like that, that was how you got sick. It's interesting because if you, it's that mind exercise of trying to think what would it have been like to live there, like you're on a game board of snakes and ladders where you just don't know what's going to happen and people can just disappear. It actually puts quotes like this into context. He said, you have only a few years in which to live really perfectly and fully. Now, that's just a, just a nice flourish, but in this game of chance, it seemed, where anyone could disappear for, for whatever reason of sickness that we didn't fully understand, it just, to me, gives it a different context. Yeah. And not only that, Death would have been a constant companion, so to speak, because it was everywhere. Children were mm. not uncommon uh, to, to have died, which is why they had such large families. Uh, and this was just part of life. It seems to be a, a sort of a, death seems to be a visitor in modern society, whereas it would have just been a constant part of life yeah. uh, that people dealt with. And you, from a medical perspective, if we're looking, this was 1860s was Louis Pasteur, which is this was when the germ theory came about, about bacteria and stuff. 
but again, this is eighteen six. This is when we're beginning to start to understand that. But when we're looking at Robert Koch and Koch's postulate, this was the linkage between microorganisms and bacteria. That was this is how a disease occurs is because of this organism and this but this wasn't until the 1880s and 1890s so they're just starting to learn and again still takes you know into the 1900s for this information to be of use and in, even at that point didn't really matter the antibiotic era wasn't until the mid 20th century anyway so he was just historically just out of step because he was 1854 to 1900 so yeah. He was just, I don't know, a decade or two too early, and he, he might have had a better intervention. Well, and not only that, we're looking at this as a time of aseptic techniques, so sterilisation was just starting. And this is because Joseph Lister, a British, British surgeon, read Pasteur's work. And so they start, he started to begin to experiment with soaking wound dressings in carbolic acid after surgery. And so this greatly reduced the actual inf post post-operative infection rate for people. Again, this is sort of the new anesthetic era as well. But not only that, Joseph Lister also started and began washing hands and instruments before they did surgery. So if imagine like you could actually walk into a you know operating theater or wherever it was they did not necessarily have to have operating theater as we'll later find out from Oscar uh, but this also washing the hands was revolutionary this was and this greatly reduced infections rates imagine imagine that kind of concept today you know people not washing hands at all just before theater and also just one other thing i remember i just found it he he has this lovely quote because europe must have been a bit of a basket case with sickness and he had this quote many american women on leaving their native land adopt the appearance of chronic ill health under the misapprehension that illness is a form of european refinement <laughs> And and again, you just see that kind of reflection of society, which just fits today. And uh, and the again, we're we're learning about things. So they didn't know about infectious disease, but they started to know about public health. And this was where they're looking at. This is the time John Snow, uh, who was an English physician. And this story requires its own separate podcast episode. But this was where he was a physician working in Soho in London. And they were having outbreaks of cholera. These were multiple deaths. There was one episode in 1854, the same year of Oscar Wilde's birth. There was an outbreak in the area of greater than 600 people died from cholera. And they traced the cause of this to a water pump on Broad Street. And when what he realized is he went to the pump and he removed the handle from the pump so that no one could get water from this. Now, the... the Rates were reducing already, but that helped reduce it further. And later, researchers went and found that the water water supply for the pump was very close to a cesspit, oh. and the fecal material was draining into the the water, and then clearly spreading cholera. Now they didn't know what was happening, but they knew public health that that was causing illness, and so he was sort of the you know uh, public health. Uh, pioneer in that instance and even just after it was a bit after a decade of john snow removing that handle pump you started to see it filter out throughout england and there's even uh excerpts from uh, the chatham news in 1866 of a family who had an outbreak of cholera and two of the children died and one became very ill a coroner's jury, after a careful investigation, have pronounced that one victim of cholera has perished from the use of bad water on the brook. It logically follows that the opinion of the jury was that the victim's little brother also perished from the same exciting cause, and that the other persons who have recently died on the brook from cholera became susceptible to the choleric poison which exists in this country from having drunk impure water. Mr. Eli's medical officer evidence, on which the jury gave their verdict, leads to this conclusion, that gentlemen, 
who has been most unjustly assailed for merely doing his duty, said the children were not attacked till the family, from an accidental circumstance, had to drink water from the north side of the brook. Till they were attacked, he had no cholera cases on the side of the brook where they lived. On the north side of the brook, there have been a number of fatal cases of cholera when Mr Nye's family were compelled to drink water from the north side. Two children died from cholera. A third was attacked with diarrhoea. The conclusion was obvious. Bad water was the exciting cause of the fatal outbreak. Mr Nye's children died from cholera was the unanimous opinion of a number of surgeons, military, naval and civil, who were at the inquest. So you can start to see where the seed of modern medicine is coming. This is the investigation. This is uh, examining the causes of this death. And, you know, 600 people dying, you know, a, a decade before from cholera, they're actually starting to trace it down and say, okay, we can actually identify the cause for this. And so they did an investigation, and a Mr. Henry Hadlow talked about the wells. I've made a partial analysis of the water of a well from the brook near that shut-up. I send you results. You see, it has many of the characteristics of the other surface wells about here. Large amount of solid impurity and of chlorides, excess of organic and volatile matter, and the latter contamination and its partial and imperfect oxidation. The water, however, show an unusual amount of the ordinary impurities, show traces of ammonia. Does the graveyard on the slope of the hill contribute anything to these? These shallow wells differ in degrees of foulness, but their closure would be a wholesome sanitary regulation, especially in a crowded neighbourhood where a single infected cesspool draining into a well might convey typhoid fever or cholera or any of the diseases connected with depraved water supply to the whole community. And the the really interesting thing I find about this is they would have closed water wells. It would have caused a lot of actually... Uh, problems because then people had to go to a further source and so if people didn't know why they were doing it they would have gotten quite upset and annoyed but you know it's it's (laughs) public health uh you know inconveniences but it is for the greater good and this was also the time those vaccinations were actually becoming a little bit more prevalent uh edward jenner a famous study that was happened at the end of the 1700s and the start of the 1800s did his famous study on milkmaids, uh, the observation where uh, milkmaids who were exposed to cowpox were immune to smallpox, and he did those experiments. But by 1853, the vaccinations for smallpox for babies in England started, became mandatory under the Vaccination Act. And so now many refused to have the vaccine uh, and it was termed as suspicious and ungodly, uh, you know, uh, possibly, uh, you know, discussion we're still having these days with some <laughs> some community yes. groups. But uh, but this was where they were starting. As mentioned, this was also the anaesthetic era. So previously people used alcohol. They used opium as well. Um, and there was also the mesmerism, which is effectively a, a hypnosis type style. But this gave way to the, the emergence of chloroform, ether and nitric oxide. But this was also a discussion time about if people didn't feel pain during surgery, would that mean that their body didn't realise it needed to heal? Gee. And so this was uh, an emerging time of our understanding. And it crosses over with Oscar's wife too, uh, Oscar's life, I should say, um, because he had an operation on his ear in the year of his death, which was, and I quote, the operation was carried out under anaesthetic in Wilde's hotel room on the 10th of October 1900. Um, He described the ordeal, which almost certainly involved the exteriorising of the middle ear and the mastoid cavity as most terrible. Part of the horror, though, was the expense The surgeon initially presented a bill for 1,500 francs, although it was eventually halved at the prompting of Dr. Tucker. Nevertheless, they thought the surgery had been successful, but done under anaesthetic. Well, that's right. And as we will come back and come back to, not only was he given chloroform there, so the initial part of the new anaesthetic, they also then treated him with leeches on the head to uh, for the bloodletting. And so you're seeing this... See, you know, that's why you need private health. <laughs> and the changing of the guard. And, and this was, again, doctors at the time, they're... This 
looking at it, the predominant theory was the four humours. This was blood, phlegm, yellow bile, black bile. And so disease was caused by imbalance. And so if you had too much blood, you were termed as being sanguine. If you had too much phlegm, you were phlegmatic. Too much black bile, melancholic. Yellow bile, you were choleric or biliary. And, and this is where, again, if you understand that, you can see where they're going with the treatment. Someone comes in unwell, there is an imbalance. I need to realign their, their balance. And so that's why the treatments that they had was purging, diarrhea, diuresis, or bleeding. Now, going to the doctor was also very expensive. There's not Medicare or anything that we have these days. So the, only those people with means would actually be able to go and see the doctor. Well, Oscar actually had said a few different things about poverty, by the way. He said that there's only one class in the community that thinks more about money than the rich, and that's the poor, yeah. which, which actually makes sense. The only thing that can console one for being poor is extravagance. The only thing that can console one for being rich is economy. Right. <laughs> And look, looking at the treatments, to be honest, you were probably it was a toss of the coin whether you were better <laughs> off seeing a doctor at that time. You know, get get leeches put somewhere, or you know, being given purge uh, purging medication. But the other place you could go was the apothecary, and this England at the time, this was what we would say pharmacists or chemist druggists were trained in the art of materia medica, which was an apprenticeship. And this was a handbook of their of drugs and their uses. And so you would go just like you would go to the pharmacy today and say, I need this or that. And they would ask about the ailment. And effectively what the apothecary has is a whole bunch of jars and they were either medicines that had already been made up or they were ingredients of medicines to be made up at the spot and then sold to the customer. And in a poetic twist, in 1878... Wilde had to give up the beautiful rooms that he had in college at Oxford and he took lodgings in High Street at number 71, which was above a chemist shop. <laughs> and so he could have gone downstairs and you would have seen powders, pills, tablets, capsules, lozenges, mixtures, tinctures, emulsions. You would also have ointments, lotions, plasters, enemas, suppositories, peasantries, inhalants. Anything and everything would have been there for, for whoever had the money to come in and buy. Now, we have some examples of what you could purchase at the apothecary. Caram cave, caraway seeds, used to relieve flatulent colic, especially in children. Spermacetti, whale sperm oil or wax from the head of a sperm whale. Lotion, used for the treatment of gonorrhea and catarrh. Excessive discharge, build-up of mucus, of course. It can also be mixed with wax and olive oil to make it harder and non-melting. It even becomes adhesive at that point. Extractum stramonium. It's the extract of jimson weed or thorn apple, as I'm sure you knew, Travis. Potent narcotic used for disorders of the nervous system, such as neuralgia, mania, and epilepsy. could also be used as an ointment for skin lesions, eye to dilate the pupil. Uh, Small doses, side effects include vertigo, headaches, dim vision, confusion, feelings of suffocation, sleepiness, relaxation of bowels, and diuresis, all of which persist for several hours. I don't remember reading that on the side of anything I've taken. It would give me pause for thought. And large doses of extractum stramonium, uh, the side effects include heart pain, excessive thirst, vomiting, sense of strangulation, anxiety, blindness, delirium, tremors, palsy, convulsions, and death. And they say we don't need a department that looks <laughs> over these things. And so this is something that you could go down and buy from the apothecary. And look, the... It, in all of this, this was the life of in the late 1800s. And in an interesting twist, you've got Oscar Wilde's parents. Now, this is Jane Francesca Wilde, who was a poet and writer. You have William Robert Wilde, who was an ENT surgeon. And so he was actually a, a very uh, remarkable person. He wrote a textbook on ENT surgery. He had a role in the statistics of the Irish, uh, Irish census. Uh, he was also the editor of Dublin Journal of Medical Science. He was knighted. So this is a, a 
a person that has gone very well in their career. Uh, now, he had three children before he married uh, Jane Francesca, and with Jane Francesca had two sons, William and Oscar, and a daughter, Isola. And the we keep on coming back to this date, 1854. In that year, uh, it, it is that a, a patient came to see him who was a 19-year-old Mary Trevers. Mm. Now... She visited uh, Dr. Williams Wild Surgery with her mother about hearing issues that she was having. Now, her father was Dr. Robert Trevers, who was a professor of medical, purist, medical jurisprudence. And so somehow we've gotten to the point of the, the next step in the story is that Mary Trevers was arranged to be uh, undertake informal training with Dr. Wilds in his surgery, and that was reading different uh, manuscripts or it was going through and, and doing some education. Now, this went well, but then suddenly there's this falling out between Jane Wilde, his wife, and Mary Trevers, and then she ceased, Mary ceased to work for Dr. Wilds. And so there's then this odd report of an attempted overdose from Mary, and then Mary even sent this fake death notice to Dr. Wilde. And so we're starting to enter into some very weird territory. You're not quite sure exactly what's going, but something very sort of dark or uh, someone that feels very aggrieved of having either lost their job or something's occurred. And so Dr. Wilde's actually corresponded with Mary at this time, but that didn't help. Mary went to the went to the extent of writing a pamphlet called Florence Boyd Price or a Warning. Now, this included a story of an attempted rape by a doctor to a patient who had taken chloroform. And Mary went and printed a thousand copies and then sent them to Dr. Wilde's patients. And then when Dr. Wilde was giving a lecture, out front of the lecture theatre, Mary hired five newsboys to hold placards outside the lecture hall. And then they included extracts from the letter that Dr. Wiles had sent her, as well as the pamphlet that she had written. So there's clearly the, the implication was there was some sort of more of a relationship with Mary and Dr. Wiles than, than anything else. And you've got young Oscar, you know, observing this. He was close to his mum from, from memory, although complex relationship. He did say, and I think this shows perhaps his love for his mum, he said, all women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. That's his. Mm. And and so he's watching all this going on. Mary then also goes to the next level and starts sending these pamphlets to Dr. Wilde's neighbours. And so Jane, so uh, Dr. Wilde's wife, sends a letter yes. to Mary's father, Dr. Robert Trevis, the, the professor of uh, medical jurisprudence, protesting the activities of his daughter, this being the paternalistic day that it is. And for, for this, Mary then sued Jane and Dr. Wilde for defamation and over the contents of the letter. And they, she sued and demanded uh, £2,000. And so this then, this case then went to trial. And during this case, Dr. Wilde's correspondence came up and it was deemed that this was inappropriate for, for this. But the, the rape charges were dismissed. The letter was ruled as defamation, but Mary was awarded a farthing. And a farthing is one quarter of a penny. But the Wilds were landed with the court the cost, bills, yes. which was... Two thousand pounds, and so I think this set Oscar up for the blueprint of probably a tragic mistake that he would make later in life. Dr. Travis Brown, you've named Act Two of this episode, The Rise and Fall of Oscar Wilde. Why? This is because this is a part of the life of Oscar that we know about, that the success comes and he is, even in his own time, a lot of, a lot of writers or famous people become famous after they've, they've died. And 
but he was actually um, notable in his own time. And to be honest, I think his personality was infectious. I think he was a, if you see some of the images of him, it is a, he looks, how would you oh. describe it? Dashing. Yeah. You he know. he he looks like a sort of like there's a thoughtfulness to them. There's a pensiveness with the with the the photographs and the images. He's a person who sort of knew about probably you know social media before social media was there. That is, you know. He seemed to have a self awareness, but also an awareness of how his self would be portrayed, which. I don't. I, I don't think it's anywhere near narcissism. I don't because that's got a nasty edge. He he seemed to be caught up in the romance of living a romantic life. Yeah, and also he was a poet yeah. and he was a writer. And look, he began publishing poems in as a college student in Dublin Trinity University in the eighteen seventies. One that he won a prize for was a poem called Ravenna. Do you want to hear a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Alas, my Dante, thou hast known the pain of meaner lives, the exile's galling chain. How steep the stairs with king's houses are, and all the petty miseries which mar man's nobler nature with the sense of wrong. Yet this dull world is grateful for thy song. Our nations do the homage. Even she, that cruel queen of vine-clad Tuscany, who bound with crowns of thorns thy living brow, hath decked thine empty tomb with laurels now, and begs in vain the ashes of her son. O mightiest exile, all thy grief is done. Thy soul walks now beside thy Beatrice. Ravenna guards thine ashes. Sleep in peace." And so he took a year-long lecture tour of, of North America, uh, which he, some of his writings sort of refer to. But in 1884, he married Constance Lloyd, and they had two sons. But by the, uh, by the 1890s, he had become one of London's most popular playwrights, and we have some excerpts of, from his famous plays. Well, Salome was one that was off the beaten track a bit. Um, she was... Uh I believe the wife of Herod, who wanted the head of John the Baptist, and uh, or Yakunin, as he was known before he was named John the Baptist. And there's just one lovely piece here. It was a very brooding sexual play drawn from that biblical history. And Salome says at one point, as she's trying to tempt him, I am amorous of thy body, Yakunin. The body is white like the lilies of a field that the mower hath never mowed. The body is white like the snows that lie on the mountains of Judea and come down into the valleys. The roses in the garden of the Queen of Arabia are not so white as thy body. Neither the roses of the garden of the Queen of Arabia, the garden of spices of the Queen of Arabia, nor the feet of the dawn when thy light and the leaves, nor the breast of the moon when she lies on the breast of the sea. There is nothing in the world so white as thy body. Suffer me to touch thy body. So that was an interesting play. <laughs> but also, of course, the one he's very much known for, the importance of being earnest. There's a lovely piece, and I think it ties in touch a little bit with the medical world because you've got Jack and Algernon, and they're both mischievous. They are in the city, but they like going to the country, and they've invented fake characters to give them an excuse to leave polite society. And uh, I'll just there's one little exchange here. Algernon says, The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it were either, and modern literature a complete impossibility. Jack, that wouldn't at all be a bad thing. Algernon, literary criticism is not your forte, my dear fellow. Don't try it. You should leave that to the people who haven't been at a university. They do it so well in the daily papers. What you really are is a bunbriest. I was quite right in saying you were a Bunbrius. You are one of the most advanced Bunbriists I know. Jack, what on earth do you mean? Algernon, you have invented a very useful younger brother called Ernest in order that you may be able to come up to town as often as you like. 
I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bunbury in order that I may be able to go down into the country whenever I choose. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinary bad health, for instance, I wouldn't be able to dine with you at Willis's tonight, for I have been really engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. And the way he writes is so compelling. But it's also it's also we don't write like this anymore. I, I it'd be coming it'd be hard to find someone who writes like this. Absolutely, but there's so many jewels that just go past at a million miles an hour, like you're looking out the window of a train. The literary criticism is not your forte, my dear fellow. Don't try it. Leave with the people who haven't been to university. <laughs> and this is this is playing with words. This is playing with the wit. Uh, and look. This is, though, leads into the time of his life that becomes very tumultuous. He has lots of success. But in 1891, at the age of 37, he has an affair with Lord Alfred Douglas. Now, he is a 21-year-old British poet and aristocrat, also known as Bosey. And the problem with this is Lord Alfred's father is known as the Marquess of Queensbury. Now, yes. when he found out... He was outraged about this relationship or whatever it was at the time. He's the wrong man to cross with because he's responsible for the rules of boxing. Right. Is that what mm. that is? Yes. <laughs> I didn't know what the Marquess The Marcus of Queensbury. They're the, the, the rules. Right. Uh, yep, that was him. And, and so he then accused Oscar of inappropriate behaviour, indecent acts with his son and other young men. He ended up leaving a calling card for Oscar, the porter at the private Arbor de Marley Club. And this was written, which was clearly open, for Oscar Wilde posing sodomite. And so in 1885, so a decade before, the British Criminal Law Amendment Act had criminalised all sex acts between males. And this was called gross indecency, and this was a criminal offence. And so friends of Oscar Wilde said, flee to France. Leave this, you know, get yourself out of this trouble, just leave. Now, Oscar declined and instead decided to sue the Marquess of Queensbury for defamation. And this led to a trial. And this included witnesses of, of 12 young men. And the defence even questioned Oscar about his controversial 1890 novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray. Two months ago, I went to a crush at Lady Brandon's. You know, we poor artists have to show ourselves in society from time to time just to remind the public that we are not savages. With an evening coat and a white tie, as you told me once, anybody, even a stockbroker, can gain reputation for being civilised. Well, after I'd been in the room about ten minutes talking to huge, overdressed dowagers and tedious accommodations, I suddenly became conscious that someone was looking at me. I turned halfway round and saw Dorian Gray for the first time. When our eyes met, I felt that I was growing pale. A curious sensation of terror came over me. I knew that I had come face to face with someone whose mere personality was so fascinating that if I allowed it to do so, it would absorb my whole nature, my whole soul, my very art itself. I did not want any external influence in my life. You know yourself, Harry, how independent I am by nature. I've always been my own master, had at least always been so, till I met Dorian Gray. Then, but I don't know how to explain it to you, something seemed to tell me that I was on the verge of a terrible crisis in my life. I had a strange feeling that fate had in store for me exquisite joys and exquisite sorrows. I grew afraid and turned to quit the room. It was not conscience that made me do so. It was a sort of cowardice. I take no credit to myself for trying to escape. And so three days into this trial, Oscar withdrew the lawsuit. But the authorities issued a warrant for his arrest for this indecency charges on the, on the books. Now, friends again pleaded with Oscar to leave, but he stayed. He was charged with 25 counts of gross indecency, and he was arrested and tried in court. Now, the witnesses they brought were hotel chambermaids, housekeepers, 
uh, and he was questions about, questioned about his writings as well, the, the, the phrase, the love that dare not speak its name. And so the trial ended and the jury was unable to reach a verdict, but he was retried three weeks later and then convicted. And he was sentenced to two years of hard labour, hard fare and a hard bed. And so we turn to Act 3 now, Dr. Travis Brown, Tragic Ends. You can see why we said rise and fall, and this is where I think his demise comes. Now, he was sentenced to London Pentonville Prison, uh, and for the first few months, his job was picking oakum. Now, oakum was a substance used to seal gaps in shipbuilding, and the way they got this was they would untwist old rope and pull the loose fibres apart, uh, and they would use that. Now, you could tell from his writings that Oscar was brokenhearted. He felt abandoned in prison. His uh, family changed their names and and moved away. Uh, And he wrote a a long letter called De Profundis. Society, as we have constituted it, will have no place for me, has none to offer. But nature, whose sweet rains fall on unjust and just alike, will have clefts in the rocks where I may hide, and secret valleys in whose silence I may weep undisturbed. She will hang the night with stars, so that I may walk abroad in the darkness without stumbling, and send the wind over my footprints, so that none may track me to my hurt. She will cleanse me in great waters, and with bitter herbs make me whole." Love does not traffic in a marketplace, nor use a huckster's scales. Its joy, like the joy of the intellect, is to feel itself alive. The aim of love is to love, no more and no less. You were my enemy, such an enemy as no man ever had. I had given you all my life, and to gratify the lowest and most contemptible of all human passions— hatred and vanity and greed, you had thrown it away. In less than three years, you had entirely ruined me in every point of view. For my own sake, there was nothing for me to do but love you. A sentimentalist is simply one who wants to have the luxury of an emotion without paying for it. We think we can have our emotions for nothing. We cannot. Even the finest and most self-sacrificing emotions have to be paid for. Strangely enough, this is what makes them fine. The intellectual and emotional life of ordinary people is a very contemptible affair. As soon as you have to pay for an emotion, you will know its quality and be the better for such knowledge. And remember that the sentimentalist is always a cynic at heart. Indeed, sentimentality is merely the bank holiday of cynicism. I don't regret for a single moment having lived for pleasure. I did it to the full, as one should do everything that one does. There was no pleasure I did not experience. In prison, his health deteriorates. This two-year prison sentence, he's clearly having trouble with his right ear, poor hearing... There is some suggestion of vision disturbance, although that's always a little bit challenging to get with the medical records. But he, he sees at least seven doctors, including two psychiatrists. Now, one of these is Sir William Dalby, who's an eminent uh, otologist mm. at the time. Uh, and he, this was about his right discharging ear uh, and having poor hearing. And Oscar himself wrote about this. The abscess has been running now for the entire time of his imprisonment and the hearing getting worse every week. Nothing has been done in the way of an attempted cure. Now, the doctor or the prison doctor at the time clearly did not take this complaint seriously. It is perfectly true that he has a slight perforation of the drum of the right ear, but there is no evidence of mischief in the left nor of any defect of vision. Now, the, there's an interesting step here, which, which I couldn't quite work out, and Steve, you might be able to shed some light on, but mm. the complaint of Oscar made its way to the chairman of the prison commissioner, uh, and a, a local doctor's second opinion was sought. 
perforation of left tympanic membrane, some foul discharge, which may be improved by daily syringing of the ear with dilute carbolic lotion. And so how would you think the prison, the chairman of the prison had learnt about a prisoner's complaint? This was deep into Matthew Sturgis's biography. I think there was a stroke of fate where there was a changing of the guard and somehow the, the new warden um, took pity or drew interest. And if I remember it correctly, he actually began smuggling in reading material uh, to Oscar Wilde, which was this little ray of light in what had become a life of darkness. Yeah. The statement was brief, and it also, I think, it referred to the wrong ear. So, you know, important for junior doctors. Documentation is uh, is very important and right and left. It's or you'll end up ear. being featured in this medical <laughs> life. 200 years from now. So when he was released from jail, he spent the last three years of his life in France And he wrote, the only thing that we know he wrote of was the Ballad of the Reading Jail. And this was about an execution that took place when he was there. We know not whether laws be right or whether laws be wrong. All we know who lie in jail is that the walls are strong. And each day is like a year, a year whose days are long. For our high gods have sick and wearied grown of all our endless sins, our vain endeavour, for wasted days of youth to make atone. By pain or prayer or priest and never, never, hearken they now to either good or ill, but send their reign upon the just and the unjust at will. They sit at ease, our gods, they sit at ease, strewing with leaves of rose their scented wine, They sleep, they sleep beneath the rocking trees where Ashfordell and yellow lotus twine, mourning the old glad days before they knew what evil things the heart of man could dream and dreaming do. Something was dead in each of us and what was dead was hope. By September 1900, the ear infection and discharge had returned. Uh, Now, he was living in the Hotel d'Alsace, Uh, And he did see an ear surgeon. The surgeon felt it his duty to inform me that unless I was operated on immediately, it would be too late and that the consequences of the delay would probably be fatal. Now, the operation almost certainly was a a mastoidectomy. So if you have your sort of feel where this is, uh, for the non-medical listeners, it's sort of the bone. If you tap just behind your ear, there's there's a... a bony prominence there, and this is the the mastoid. So if any of our ENT surgeons who are listening, I have no idea how they actually removed this in the 1900s. But this was done under chloroform, anaesthetic, and it was done in the hotel room. Uh, the problem was, postoperatively, he had significant pain. This was treated with opium. Uh, now, he began to recover, and he had unsteady gait and, and what they term as giddiness, But by the second week of November, his condition deteriorated uh, and he was asked how he was. My wallpaper and I are fighting a duel to the death. One or other of us must go. Can I just say, he did have that wit around death, that sort of uh, assumption of... Well, pathos, really, and it's because he did say another thing I'd like, which was, uh, "I shall never make a new friend in life, though I rather hope to make a few in death." <laughs> we get to it ends up being the twenty fifth of November, and he starts to have pain and fever, delirium, and the doctors note note made some notes about this. Having examined Mister Oscar Wilde on Sunday, twenty fifth September have found serious cerebral disturbances resulting from a long-standing separation of the right ear, which has been undergoing treatment for several years. On the 27th, the symptoms became much worse. The diagnosis of meningoencephalitis must be made without doubt. In the absence of any localising signs, one cannot contemplate trepanation. The recommended treatment is purely medical. Surgical intervention seems not to be possible. He was treated with ice packs and leeches to his head uh, as the time. Uh, Now, it is pretty much consensus, and I think 
for the most part, people would agree that Oscar Wilde did die of meningoencephalitis, uh, secondary to uh, chronic right middle ear disease. Some doctors have uh, done similar to what we've done, gone through the, the historical records. And there's been even a suggestion that, uh, that Oscar Wilde had a cholesteatoma, which is a lump or a cyst that develops in the middle ear. It occurs in about 1 in 20,000 people. Uh, and if this grows and gets larger, it can cause this persistent discharge in a smelly ear uh, that requires surgical invention. But it also can become destructive. And so there's been discussions about that. It's completely academic. It's an interesting point. Mm. There is, if anyone does search Oscar Wilde and look at his history, inevitably what comes up is is this uh, diagnosis of syphilis. But this was first raised by British journalist Arthur Ranson in 12 years after Oscar's death. And and it has sort of resurfaced in the you know, 1980s by sort of some prominent authors. But there's actually no documentary evidence of this. Uh, it's not mentioned in any of, the, any of the medical histories. There's no signs that his wife got or children mm. would have had it if he had had syphilis. Uh, and he had been seen by multiple doctors, even in prison. No mention of this. So this is why I always call syphilis the great historical defamer. It's it's kind of a, a smear, you know, after someone's life that, oh, they had syphilis and the implications with that. I don't recall Matthew Sturgis drawing attention to it either. It's, and his biography, which is the most recent one, is very thorough. And, and, that's, and that's the main part. Inevitably, if you go searching for it, it comes up. Yeah. But... It's the it's nothing more than hearsay. It's actually not. There's no evidence behind it, and so this is why, as I say, the historical defamer. It's a sort of a, a smear of someone, and so look, it's just one of those things that I, I, as we conclude, sort of Oscar Wilde's life. It's it's hard not to think, you know, what could have been. He was a sort of a remarkable person that was sort of <laughs> drawn into this dark world of that time, uh, and you know what. If he had have lived longer or, you know, not gone to jail, you know, what plays might have existed today um, that had been written of him. But it wasn't to be. And so, look, having started off with one of Oscar's most famous witticisms or quotes today, we'll leave you with one of Oscar's other famous quotes. Well, to give it context, he did say, life is too important to be taken seriously. Now, perhaps this is the note to finish on. And I think this is a beautiful, poignant one to finish with. To live is the rarest thing in the world. Most people exist. That is all. This Medical Life is recorded in the Talked About Marketing Studios in Adelaide. For show notes and more information about the podcast, visit thismedicallife.com.au. You can contact the hosts on social media. Dr. Travis Brown can be found on X. His username is at Dr. Travis Brown. That's D-R Travis Brown. And Steve Davis can be found on LinkedIn. Go to linkedin.com slash IN slash The Real Steve Davis. This has been a Path Notes Proprietary Limited production.